And joining us now, Jayantha Dhanapala. He is president of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. Welcome to Canada. Thank you. Nice to have you here at TVO. Do you want to start by just telling us what the Pugwash Conferences are? Well, Pugwash Conferences are an international movement devoted to nuclear disarmament, which was actually born on Canadian soil in a fishing village in Nova Scotia when Cyrus Eaton, the well-known industrialist who took an active role in trying to mitigate the worst effects of the Cold War between the old Soviet Union and the United States, uh, gave his uh, cottage in uh, Bugwash for the use of 22 uh, physicists from around the world, led by the great Lord Bertrand Russell, the mathematician and philosopher. And thus was born this movement, which now encompasses over 50 countries with scientists and uh, others around the world devoted to the cause of nuclear disarmament, which earned them the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995. But we have broadened our uh, agenda into working not only on uh, nuclear weapons, but also working on conflicts in areas where nuclear weapons are likely to be used. And that is what I want to follow up on right now. Right. And to start our discussion, I want to quote Andrew Krepinevich, who is the defense policy analyst, whom I'm sure you know. And here is what he wrote uh, last month. For several decades, substantial intellectual effort was devoted to understanding the U.S.-Soviet nuclear competition. With the Cold War's end, nuclear weapons proliferation has become an increasingly important issue. Yet there has been comparatively little analysis. According to some analysts, the end of the Cold War ushered in a second nuclear age, characterized by the further spread of nuclear weapons to nations in Asia and fears that non-state actors might acquire these weapons as well. In which case, tell us what your greatest security worries are in this so-called second nuclear age. Well, the greatest nuclear worries are that we could have a nuclear weapon being used either by accident or by design, and by state actors who have nuclear weapons, or by non-state actors, terrorist groups. So it sounds so more dangerous than the Cold War. It's become much more diversified, much more complex, and much more dangerous than the Cold War situation. And in the Cold War, we were always afraid that we were at one minute Absolutely. to midnight. So you're saying yeah. it's actually more dangerous than one minute to midnight. It's now actually six minutes to midnight, according to the bulletin of the atomic scientists mm -hmm. based in Chicago who have this famous uh, clock, the doomsday clock. And uh, they moved it backwards by a minute because of the Obama administration's policies, which relaxed the tensions to some extent. But we are still very close to doomsday. But the, oh, you, oh, well, let me follow up. Close to doomsday. Again, when I was a kid, you worried about the Soviet Union and the United States having an all-out nuclear war, and that's the end of everything. Mm -hmm. I think today it's fair to say people are concerned about a nuclear weapon going off, but it probably, it's not the end of everything. It's a suitcase bomb in Times Square, which could be the end of New York City, but not the end of the world. Is that accurate? Even a dirty bomb, which is what the worst case scenario is if the terrorists do get their hands on some amount of enriched uranium or plutonium and wrap it around with some Con conventional explosive, that could cause a huge amount of damage, killing thousands of people, destroying buildings, and also it could really uh, trigger some repercussions because not many people will realize that this is a, a suitcase bomb or a, a dirty bomb that has been exploded. And there might be other uh, repercussions which can cause a, 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 a wave of these uh, other explosions. But even that, uh, when we talk about a limited nuclear war, we can't really limit it because of the climatic effects of some of these uh, impacts. And uh, the research that has just been uh, conducted in the United States shows that if the Indians and the Pakistanis have a nuclear exchange, this can cause uh, tremendous climate change. So we should not assume that just because it's happening halfway around the world, Absolutely. we're immune to it somehow. Quite right. Okay. You're from Sri Lanka originally. That's, That's still right. home for you. I'd like to know what it's like for your country to be so close, India and Pakistan, to these two nuclear powers, and your country does not have nuclear weapons, and your country does not have a nuclear umbrella either. What's that like? No. Sri Lanka has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and has been a country in good standing as far as that treaty is concerned. 
We don't even have a nuclear power for uh, energy purposes. We do, of course, have uh, nuclear energy for medicine and for agriculture and, and other purposes, helped by the International Atomic Energy Agency. But it is very uncomfortable to be in a dangerous neighborhood with our two giant neighbors uh, at each other uh, on a number of uh, disputes, Kashmir being the main one, and both of them being now nuclear weapon-armed countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it is certainly not a comfortable position to be in, and uh, we hope, therefore, that there will be nuclear disarmament globally, uh, because it's not enough to say that you want your South Asian neighbors to disarm. We really want the world to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Well, let me put two more places on the list as well, the Middle East and the Far East, yes. uh, North Korea, uh, Iran and North Korea, rather. How concerned are you about the threat that those two programs pose to world peace? Well, we are concerned. Uh, we are co more concerned with the uh, North Koreans because there, there is no dispute about the fact that they have crossed the threshold. They have uh, detonated two uh, tests, and they do have a very small nuclear weapon arsenal. But we are also comforted by the fact that there is a framework of six nation talks that are going on, which uh, represents the hope that there will be, through diplomatic means, the uh, eventual uh, denuclearization of North Korea. On the case of Iran, uh, we still don't know the truth of what the situation is, because what we do know is that the Iranians have enriched uranium without reporting it to the IAEA. They have violated their safeguards agreements, and now they are in contravention of Security Council resolutions. But the intelligence estimates, both of the United States and other countries, do not show conclusively that they have a plan to acquire a nuclear weapon. And I think that is important because we made ghastly mistakes about Iraq, as you know, and we don't want to repeat that mistake. So we must, I think, exploit the diplomatic route. And right now there are countries like Brazil and Turkey working that diplomatic route. My organization has also been engaged in track two diplomacy with the Iranians bringing Iranian leaders together with uh, other Western leaders together in uh, unreported and uh, below the radar kind of contacts in order to improve trust and understanding. And I think that's very important. Remember always that Libya was a cause for great anxiety in the past. But Libya, through diplomatic means, has now come back into full compliance with the NPT. And so I'd like to use that example to show that diplomacy has enormous potential. You know, if Ronald Reagan were here, may he rest in peace, he'd say it had more to do with um, him dropping bombs on Libya than any treaty or diplomacy, and that's why Gaddafi is behaving today. But that's another program. The follow-up I wanted to say was, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has compared the situation in Iran to Germany in 1938. In other words, one year before the Holocaust. And he says, we're not going to do that again. If the Israelis were to attack Iran in an attempt to disrupt their nuclear program, how would you and your organization view that? Well, first of all, I think Mr. Netanyahu's statement is a very self-serving kind of statement which only justifies uh, what he's doing. We know that uh, Israel has had nuclear weapons for a very long time, and that itself is uh, completely contrary to the needs of uh, the international community. On uh, the uh, possibility of uh, Israeli attack, I think we would be completely horrified at the use of this uh, extreme step, uh, because first of all, it's a violation of the sovereignty of Iran. There is no proof that we are going towards a nuclear weapon possession. Uh, it is possible that the Iranians are wanting to reach the nuclear weapon capability state, which a lot of countries are at. Japanese, Swedes, Australians, and so on, uh, where they have nuclear power for peaceful purposes, but there is no evidence that uh, there is going to be anything uh, other than that. And so we have to work the diplomatic route. Both sanctions and the preemptive strike has proved to be uh, futile. We know that when the Israelis attacked Osirak some time ago, Iraq, Iraq mm -hmm. uh, in uh, that particular nuclear reactor, the evidence now shows that the Saddam Hussein regime just bounced back. 
and it really didn't make that much of an uh, impact. Uh, well, it might have bought them 10 years, didn't it? Well, probably, but in the case of Iran, it would be very different because they have dispersed their yes. enrichment in several parts of the country mm -hmm. geographically. They've placed it under mountains and so on. So even if you attack one point, you're not going to uh, cause that much of a setback. Sure. Let me ask you about what the Americans' plans are right now because, uh, of course, President Obama was in Prague last year and he gave a speech talking about a world without nuclear weapons and he said the United States would lead the way. And George Perkovit from the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace had this to write about that. A year later, he says, it appears that proponents and critics selectively interpreted or misinterpreted Obama's vision. More importantly, the range of states whose cooperation would be necessary to implement the Prague agenda either oppose it or have done little to help achieve it. The result is a talented president ready to lead a long-term campaign to remove the existential threats posed by nuclear weapons, but as yet lacking sufficient colleagues and followers to make it happen. So in your view, how much progress has been made towards what you would like to see, a nuclear-free world, since President Obama's address in Prague? Well, in the year after the Prague uh, spring speech, as it were, we have seen some progress. We've got the New Star Treaty, which represents a 30% reduction in deployed strategic warheads. We've had- That's the US and Russia. US and Russia. Mm -hmm. We've uh, had uh, the promise of further reductions after that uh, treaty is ratified by both the US Senate and the Russian Duma. We've had a uh, new nuclear posture review, which has considerably narrowed the possibility of the actual use of nuclear weapons. And given non-nuclear weapon states in full compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the assurance that they will not be attacked with nuclear weapons, and that is a great step forward. Uh, thirdly, we've had the Nuclear Security Summit held in Washington, which at the level of uh, head of state and head of government has resulted in uh, complete a commitment to the cause of nuclear security so that the likelihood of terrorists acquiring nuclear materials or capturing nuclear facilities is considerably reduced. Uh, critics of this New START treaty that the United States and Russia signed say both countries have still got enough nuclear weapons Absolutely. left over to blow up the world many times over, so Absolutely. have we made that much progress after all? I think we must uh, welcome uh, small steps towards the goal. Uh, but there are the promise of more steps. And uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty's eighth review conference has just begun in New York. I was there in the first week. The statement made by the Secretary of State of the United States, Hillary Clinton, was very positive. It announced transparency measures. They are telling us for the first time how many nuclear weapons they have. They've never done that before. So that's positive. That's positive. They've also promised to uh, ratify the protocols of two nuclear weapon-free zones, which for a long time had not received the attention of the United States. Uh, only one uh, nuclear weapon-free zone, and that is the, the Latin American and the Caribbean nuclear weapon-free zone, had their protocols ratified by all of the nuclear weapon states within the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So that's another step. They're going to also start a fund to give developing countries uh, nuclear energy for the areas of medicine and agriculture. And that's, again, a positive step. And more than that, the resolution on the Middle East, which was adopted under my presidency in 1995 when the treaty was indefinitely extended, is going to be implemented with some kind of practical steps so that the Arab states feel that there is going to be some movement towards making their region a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. Well, let me follow up on that. And to that end, I want to read you something written by Jack David in the Wall Street Journal. This is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Combating Weapons of Mass Destruction. And he wrote this back in March of this year. Proponents of nuclear zero sometimes argue that if the U.S. and Russia eliminated their nuclear arsenals, other nations would follow their lead. But where's the evidence, he asks. Since 1991, the U.S. has unilaterally moved towards nuclear disarmament, it reduced the number of operationally deployed nuclear warheads to fewer than 2,200 from 13,000. It ended nuclear testing. It neither produced nor designed new nuclear warheads. It ended the production of fissile materials for nuclear warheads. But these actions have not persuaded any nuclear countries to follow suit. So the question is, uh, is there any evidence that with the U.S. and Russian weapons reductions, others are picking up on this as well? That's a fallacy for two reasons. The gap between what the United States and Russia have 
as and within that and what the other nuclear weapon states have is quite considerable. With regard to UK, France, China, and the others, it's in the hundreds. Whereas with regard to Russia and uh, the United States, it's in the thousands. So the other countries say that when they come down to levels that we have, we will join the multilateral process. But so we have some then. way to go. Right. So not till then, because they yeah. think it's premature for them to join in this, because for them, what they have is, is, is uh, very small compared to the arsenals of others. The second thing is that when the leadership was shown by the United States in a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, you had other countries following suit. Mm -hmm. For example, China, which would be very reluctant to abandon nuclear weapon testing, followed suit and signed the treaty. Everybody signed it. Unfortunately, with the change of regime and the Bush administration coming into Washington, they refused to uh, submit the treaty for ratification. The Obama administration will resubmit the treaty, mm -hmm. and hopefully when it is done, there will be the ratification by the uh, United States Senate, and then there will be others also joining in so that that treaty will enter into force. But let me mention those countries that we've talked about already, North Korea, Iran, India, Pakistan. What effect do you think Iran the... Iran is not a nuclear weapon state. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the countries that I guess the world assumes are pursuing, either has or are pursuing nuclear weapons programs. Do you, what effect do you think this treaty will have on those countries? Oh, it will have an enormous effect uh, if the reductions are deep enough. Because what we are doing eventually is to outlaw nuclear weapons. And what we must have is a nuclear weapon convention. Now, Lou, there are three categories of weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. We have a biological weapon convention as far back as 1972. We have a chemical weapons convention negotiated in the 1990s in the Conference of Disarmament. And these are verifiable treaties which have now established a norm that those two categories of weapons of mass destruction are outlawed. They are delegitimized. We must do the same thing with nuclear weapons. Otherwise, these become a badge of honor, as it were, to join the big boys club. Well, you are certainly the right guy to be talking to about this, because you were the president of the 1995 Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. Uh, that's the major, just for the purposes of telling our friends at home, the major international treaty on controlling the spread of nuclear weapons. Tell me this, though. Why do you think this treaty has not completely succeeded in preventing nuclear proliferation? Because the central bargain that was endemic in that treaty, one was that the non-nuclear weapon states would give up legally their option of acquiring nuclear weapons under verifiable conditions where the IAEA has safeguards, in return for which the nuclear weapons states said that under Article 6 of that treaty, they would give up their nuclear weapons. In 40 years, what has been achieved is very little. We are still down to 23,300 nuclear weapons amongst these countries. So a lot of the non-nuclear weapon states feel that they have got uh, a, a, a dud bargain, actually. Mm. And the other uh, part of the deal was the incentive of giving them uh, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Right now, there are a lot of hesitation about doing that because they feel that these countries might convert the peaceful uses into non-peaceful uses, despite the fact that we have safeguards and despite the fact that we have now what is called an additional protocol which will ensure that uh, there is no cheating uh, because of IAEA inspections. What countries in the world t that today do not have nuclear weapons do you think are actively pursuing their acquisition at the moment? Well, it is difficult to read the minds of countries, No, do we have the evidence, but I think we don't see any evidence of any. There are questions certainly about Iran that have to be answered by Iran itself, and that is a dialogue that is going on between the International Atomic Energy Agency and Iran. Uh, I might add that it is important to uh, point out that during the Shah's regime, the United States had no problem whatsoever but the Shah wanting to have peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But because we have a different regime in Tehran now, it has become uh, very, very objectionable. We need to, of course, build confidence and make sure that what the Iranians are doing are well within the parameters mm -hmm. 
of the nuclear non-proliferation okay. Every, Everybody knows Iran, but for example, Syria. The Israelis, a couple of years ago, dropped a bomb in again, the middle of Syria. That's, again, an uh, area which has to be probed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. They complain that the Syrian authorities have not been fully uh, frank with them on that matter. So we need to apply diplomatic pressure on the Syrians in order to provide us with the materials. What about the Saudis and the Egyptians? Do you have any reason to believe they're trying? There is no, no evidence whatsoever. No. And do you think they are? I don't think they are. Any other countries that you think may be on the verge or are trying to acquire? Not that, not that we know of, certainly. Okay. Let's uh, move on to um, the importance of international security in getting to zero, a world without nuclear weapons. And to that end, I want to quote Gideon Rachman, who is a Financial Times chief foreign affairs commentator, who says the following. The actual achievement of a world without nuclear weapons would be dangerous. Nobody can prove it is nuclear weapons that have kept the peace among the world's main powers since 1945. But the likeliest explanation is that conflict between nuclear armed states is just too dangerous to consider. The balance of terror works. War between big powers would once again become thinkable. In previous eras, the rise and fall of great powers has almost always been accompanied by war. The main reason for hoping that the rise of China will be an exception to this grisly rule is that both the U.S. and China have nuclear weapons. Deprived of nuclear weapons, the world's most powerful states might also put more effort and money into conventional arms or into other nasties, such as chemical and biological weapons. What do you think of his argument? Well, first of all, we are spending $1,464 billion a year on weapons, which are conventional weapons. Uh, so we are already spending huge sums of money about the level of the Cold War expenditure without uh, abolishing nuclear weapons. And therefore, uh, the prompt global strike and other precision-guided missiles have reached a level of sophistication and lethality uh, without necessarily using nuclear weapons, which will make it sufficient for countries to defend themselves if their concern is their national security. The second point is nobody can prove that nuclear deterrence has worked. Uh, it's you know, like believing uh, in a certain uh, thing without being able to prove it, whether you believe in ghosts or not. Uh, the third problem is that with regard to the uh, zero option, uh, you will have a verifiable regime to ensure that everybody is observing the uh, zero option so that we are down to nothing, actually. Okay, but what about his point that, that not having nuclear weapons makes, more, makes war more likely because it is thinkable? A, a nuclear war is unthinkable. Conventional war is thinkable. We do it all the time. Even with nuclear weapons in the possession of nine countries today, we are still having 16 major armed conflicts mm -hmm. in 2008. But not among nuclear states. But we've had wars between India and Pakistan even after 1998. The Kargil War mm. was something that everybody got very, very concerned about yes. because they thought it would escalate into a nuclear war. We've had proxy wars during the time of the Cold War in which, uh, obviously, Vietnam and other uh, countries, the uh, Soviet Union was helping to arm new, you know, South, uh, North Vietnam and the Americans were supporting South mm -hmm. Vietnam. So we've had lots of wars. And we found that in the Vietnam conflict, where a major nuclear weapon state was involved, in Afghanistan, where the Soviet Union was involved, uh, nuclear weapons were useless, militarily useless. Can't use them. You can't use them. And uh, the same is true in today's two major conflicts that are going on in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Nobody would dream, no commander, military commander, would dream of using military uh, using uh, nuclear weapons for military purposes. So, Mr. Donapala, let me ask you one last question in our last 30 seconds. You point out there are still thousands of these weapons in existence in our world today. Is a world without nuclear weapons gen genuinely achievable? It is achievable. We scaled many mountains in international relations. We thought that slavery could not be abolished because it was an institution that fed a lot of economies in the world, but it was abolished. We have thought that women's right to vote would not be achievable. It was achieved. We thought that apartheid was immutable, but it was destroyed finally. And so I'm sure that we can, uh, with the right political will on the part of countries and the leadership of people like President Obama, achieve the abolition of nuclear weapons. 
It's a great pleasure to meet you, and thank you so much for sparing some time for us at TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you.